everyone. Who just got really emotional? Right? Um, wow, that's a lot. Uh, my name is Emily. I'm one of the executive directors and co-founders of this festival. Thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, it's crazy. It's final panel. Um, it's been an amazing, amazing weekend. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, I hope you've had a good time. I hope it's been great. I hope you've seen a lot of amazing TV. I hope you've heard amazing conversations at the beginning of this. If you were there opening night, um, we talked about wanting you to be inspired by the conversations here. Um, whoa, getting emotional. I'm good, guys. I'm good. We're all going to get through this together. Um, and making new friends and really leaving here with great memories. And on opening night, I was like, I hope you'll discover your new favorite TV show. The thing about the festival is sometimes we also have to celebrate the end of our favorite TV show. And uh, it's very bittersweet, but I couldn't think of a better panel for us to end on this year and a better show for us to be celebrating together. FX is an amazing partner of ours. We love them so much. And to introduce the panel, I'm going to bring out one of my favorite people, uh, Tim Goodman from The Hollywood Reporter. Who's excited? I've totally been waiting for this. This is awesome. Uh, can't see that scene again because I'm going to cry, but I'm super excited to get into this uh, conversation. So we have a big panel. We have a, a lot of questions, a lot of stuff to get to. Uh, if they don't want to answer it, we're going to pressure them. We're going to make them give us answers. What a packed house. This is awesome. Okay. So uh, we want to start it off with executive producer and director who directed the, fina uh, the season finale and the series finale, Chris Long. <laughs> Actor Hello. Brandon J. Durden. <laughs> Actress Holly Taylor. Actor Noah Emmerich. <laughs> Actor Matthew Reese. Actor. You know, Henry, ah! you know, Henry messes everything up. All right. Sorry, I messed that up. John messed that up. We're going to blame, you know, we're going to blame Henry because that's what we should be doing. Actor, Kedrick Salati. I feel bad because backstage I told Kedrick that he, that, that's Henry. He, he was, it's his fault. So now it's my, now it's my fault. Actress Carrie Russell. Showrunner and executive producer Joel Fields. Creator, showrunner, and executive producer Joe Weisberg. Hey, we did it, or you did it, you guys. So lots to get to. Uh, super excited to, ha to, to be able to do this. We did this in New York about a year ago for, with a couple of you guys. Um, first of all, just uh, want to say, just from a critical standpoint, uh, this series, Hall of Fame First Ballot, it's one of the greatest dramas ever on American television. Congratulations. And as you know, super, super hard to, uh, so much pressure in the last season, but particularly the season finale to sort of, as we say, stick the landing, and you guys totally did that. Yeah. 
So, no pressure. Okay, um, so uh, I'm, I'm sure the audience is gonna have tons of questions later. And I know that you guys have answered a number of these questions over, so I'm, I, I didn't watch any of that or listen to any of that. I had my own takes, uh, crying when I watched it, all kinds of different um, emotions. Also, uh, because I know you guys are super happy for, the, for getting it done. Um, I wanted to talk a little about, bit about over, sort of the overall finale tone uh, and uh, talk to you both a little bit uh, about sort of like this, this idea of sort of exacting a toll. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, it's funny you, you use that phrase because I think we also had that phrase in our exact phrase in our heads. Um, a lot of people, you know, talk to us a lot about the idea, well, should Philip and Elizabeth, do they have to, do they have to pay some kind of price? Does, does there have to be a, a price for what they did? And, and we, didn't, we didn't think in those terms. It didn't seem to, to us that, you know, as somebody said, that this was a court, a criminal court in which they were going to be judged. Uh, but it did seem that there was, had to be some sort of emotional or, or, or psychic toll for, for what they had done, and that the place for that to play out was kind of inside, inside their family. And, and we didn't have an answer for, you, you know, we, we didn't want to seem like judges from on high. We just wanted to see where the story went and what would happen to everybody. And we were sure that it was going to be tragic on some level, and we just started, you know, playing out the, playing out the different things and, and where it took us seemed that the toll that took when you looked at them, when you looked at Philip and Elizabeth standing there at the end and what had happened to them and losing their kids, oh, well, that's, that's a hell of a toll. What he said, yeah. <laughs> that's clever. I see what you just did there. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I guess, Carrie, uh, it, it, you know, also, it's probably important to say for, for everybody here, everybody's going to have their own interpretations of the ending. And I know that as creators, you guys kind of want that, right? I mean, you, you, you hear from musicians all the time, so they write a song, and people interpret it one way, and then they're like, well, it's not really what I wanted, but if that's important to you and it moves you in some way, that's great. So I guess that's part of the, the contract you have with the audience. They can interpret things their own way. A lot of stuff is uh, left to interpretation, in which I, I particularly love, and I think Americans like Americans, but Americans do like sort of like absolution, and they want to have uh, everything be clear-cut, in it, and it wasn't, but Carrie, in your character, did you feel that in this, in this uh, season finale, series finale, this last uh, episode, that uh, Elizabeth, this idea of her exacting a toll, that, that she was paying some karmic price uh, for, in losing her kids? And what was your take on that? I'm going to fall off this chair. Um, uh, did I feel like... I it just felt right. It just felt, it, it was absolutely surprising to read. And I think the thing that I, um, that I quoted before was Tommy Shlami saying, you know, after he had read it, one of our directors of the show um, had said, you know, after I read it, I thought, you know, I, I did want that, this couple to pay in some way. And they made them pay in the worst possible way. Um, but yeah, I, I did. I love it. I, I think it, it makes absolute sense, and it's heartbreaking. Uh, two, two scenes in particular when Philip tells you, when you're like, we have to go get Henry. It's awful. Yeah, I mean, it's like, they, they, were, they were just written so well. I don't think we even spent that much time on them. They, you know, that's the news, and it's not good. Um, but I think it's so cool you know they i feel like what joe and joel they they allowed elizabeth to stay elizabeth for the whole series like she didn't have to you know suddenly become nice and you know <laughs> give everyone back tickles every night to bed and you know what i mean she <laughs> got to stay who she was and i think those scenes are the first real kind of break down emotional scenes for her. Um, but I, I loved it, I loved the end. And, and she, and uh, obviously there's a, there's a divide that played out in the last season and then to this final season where Philip and Elizabeth were, there was a, a tug and pull for both Russia and staying in the States and becoming, Philip becoming more American as we, from that first episode onward and you have this thing. Uh, there was, it seemed like there was, might've been a little tunnel vision on, on Elizabeth's part when she's like, 
when he's, he clearly tells her, we can't get Henry. And you seem real, you, uh, your character obviously seems really shocked about that and broken up. And then the second uh, uh, scene in that is, you know, when you're on the train and Paige steps off. Can you walk us through that? Walk you through the scene? Well, just like, uh, how, you know, Guys, that, I'm perform that, it for you. Um, no, I, I think um, I, what I love about the writing of that scene is, um, is Philip has already come to that conclusion. And so when he presents it, I don't think it's emotional at all. It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? We're not leaving Henry. Like, what are you talking about? And I think it's in the realization sort of and watching him like he's still talking. And going, oh my God, we're at, that's what's the devastating part to me. Um, that like slow realization of it. Um, and those scenes are so fun to do with Matthew. Um, and that's one of the great things about this show. I feel like, um, you know, you're only as good as your scene partner, basically. It's sort of like playing a sport, like you're only as good as your opponent or your, who you're playing against. And I feel like that's been one of the, um, Best things about the show is getting to work with you. And, <laughs> and, and, and for you guys, when you went when writing it, what, there was, uh, I mean, there's some parallels there. It's, uh, you know, she's, she's completely devoted to Mother Russia from the beginning and ends up a motherless child. And at the end, um, there's some symmetry there. Uh, w when did you know Paige was going to get off the plane, um, uh, train? Well, somewhere around the end of season one, beginning of season two, Joe and I started, took a long walk and had this idea for the end of the show. And it wasn't exactly this beat for beat because a lot of that, a lot of the specifics were figured out and the, the fact that it was a train wasn't figured out until we were really writing the sequence itself. It was every other mode of transportation you could imagine. But that, the notion of the two of them having made it back to the USSR without both or at least without one of their children, is what came to us then. And as with all of our ideas, we were, we're big planners. We write them down. We had our big series document that we would always work from. And a large percentage of the time, those ideas would hold. A large percent of those, uh, the time, those would be triggers for other ideas. And then some percentage of the time, we would look and realize we just hadn't done something we thought we would do. And when we finished writing the script, we looked at each, looked at each other with some surprise and, and realized that, that that original ending had stuck. Yeah. And uh, Chris, I want to bring you in from the end. I just, just to keep up with this scene here, uh, you know, you're, you're matching you two's with or without you, like so fantastically uh, with all the action that's happening uh, emotionally. But um, I went back and did a little bit of timing on it. It was, it was to me, it was interesting. Uh, there's nine minutes uh, of silence before Elizabeth has her dream, right? Where she says, "I didn't want, I never wanted the kid anyway." So there's there's nine minutes of silence after, and then after she speaks that line, uh, no other line is said for another eight minutes. That's 17 minutes of silence, which is almost unheard of on television. How, why'd you do that? Yeah, well, these guys are great at that. I mean, we did it actually in uh, one of the season openers where we dug a hole. And if you guys remember. Remember that sequence? Yeah, that was another one that had about 11 or 12 minutes of, uh, of silence. Uh, Joel and Joel write in such a way that it's very cinematic. So it allows you to play. They, they, they write it to be silent. They want it to be filmic. They want it to be cinematic. So, of course, as a director, it just gives you so much license and freedom to do that stuff. You know, the train sequence was an incredibly hard sequence to shoot. I mean, we had to shoot it in, in one day. Um, it was all light dependent, of course. And the train had to pull in and pull out. Most of the sequences you see that are shot on trains in uh, movies and television are shot on a green screen. You know, somebody has purchased a, a train car and they shoot it against the green screen. So it's much easier to shoot on a train, sorry, much easier to shoot on a plane than a train. Like the plane that we did, we just got a plane and we cut it in half and separated it and, and shot it. But because we have to have the guys arriving, the border guards arriving, and then, of course, the, the big reveal of Holly, we had to shoot it on a train that pulled into a station and then pulled out all in one day. And, you know, you can't shoot it on an Amtrak train because Amtrak won't allow you to shoot on their trains at the moment. Um, so then we had to shoot it on a Metro Line train in this place called Tuckahoe at this uh, Crestwood station. That was it. Thank you, Holly. Um, and... Uh, uh, 
and, and literally you just get, you know, they're so expensive to rent. The train comes from Grand Central. You stick it on this train line and, they, and you, you know, it's, it's, you're at the mercy of moving the bloody thing, which is like another whole thing. Every time you want to move it, you have to go through some central source. And so it's, the, 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 the light was just melting away and it's just a constant, you know, fantastic for these actors because they just really constantly just bring it to you just time and time and time again and they were very aware I think all of them were very aware how of of the pressure that we were under it's barely the, it's barely the question you asked me but anyway it was a <laughs> long answer and uh you know just a little scene deconstruction on because I think that, that this whole episode I mean the season's fantastic but the whole episode is gonna it's iconic and it's gonna be talked about for a long time and and fans have different reactions to it but just a little bit more on that you um you know, you're playing uh, a U2 song, Irish band, but rock and roll is an American idiom, and it's there's a long it's a long travel scene, obviously, and that's playing through much of it. Uh, once they start trans they start transferring into uh, to Russia, where you switch to Tchaikovsky and choose None But the Lonely Heart uh, when these two are are there. How much thought and it went into? I'm I'm assuming a lot. That's kind of a dumb question, but what <laughs> what was the process of putting that together to have like two worlds? Uh, and music that's evocative uh, uh, on both both a classical music and a rock and roll music. We spent, wouldn't you guys say, more time on the music for those sequences than we, we always spend a lot of time on music, looking at a lot of different options, putting the music up against the picture, trying to find what works. But I wouldn't be surprised if we spent five times more on those music choices than we ever did. Uh, we were so, on the finale in general, editing, spent so much, we were so obsessive about it because it was the finale and we wanted everything to be perfect. But the music choices for those sequences were particularly difficult, in part because of what you're saying about how long they were, because the, the music cues had to be very, very long, and most songs aren't that long, in part because there were so many different scenes going on. And it's very hard to find a song that's musically right when there are a lot of different scenes, because different scenes have different emotional feelings. So usually one song can't bridge that many different scenes because it just won't feel emotionally right over so many different scenes. So it was really, really challenging. I and mean, we just kept trying song after song after song. And you add that to how obsessive we were because we wanted it to be perfect. And it took a long time. We spent you know, way longer. Also, on, on the Tchaikovsky, uh, it's interesting how the creative subconscious process works. We had tried so many different options there, and then we looked at each other and, and said, well, what about the Tchaikovsky piece that we used that Elizabeth, that, that Claudia played for Elizabeth and Page? Would that work? And as soon as it dropped in, it became clear that not only did the piece work beautifully, but it really was if our subconscious collectively had planned it from the beginning of the season. Yeah, and uh, Matthew, uh, for, for Philip's character, um, it's a really interesting place he ends up, for, um, especially when we meet him, meet him in basically in the beginning of the series, uh, at the end of that scene where I said the silence is broken. You're speaking Russian, you're in the car. Uh, that broke an eight minute, another eight minute silence. But Phil, Philip doesn't really, I mean, you have your own take on this, obviously. Does Philip really want to be in uh, Russia at that moment? No. Yeah. I don't, I think is my short answer. You know, in, in episode one of season one, he said, let's defect. And I, I think he was, he always, you know, from that day kind of knew there's a, there's a very loud clock ticking on this one. And I'd like to save our children. Uh, and I don't think, you know, he did like America. Um, and I think, I think in regard to the children, it's decimated him. Yeah. And did, was there any thought of, you know, when he's, she has nothing when she gets back, but you essentially still have Martha and Misha. <laughs> which, which one was Martha? <laughs> I also left a great, you know, a far, a far greater deal. I, I left a failed travel agency. I left a new car, a mobile phone, and a new suit that I never got to wear. So I think Philip's sacrifice was far greater, to be perfectly honest. And they, and they pull out car stereo in, from uh, episode one. Yeah, who's, oh, yeah, where's that now? We should have had you bring that with you. That would have been a great beat. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, just as you, we'll get used to it. Yes, we will. <laughs> uh, so, and uh, I think we've actually talk, mentioned this when, when we talked in New York, but Carrie, uh, 
<laughs> were you particularly um, uh, drawn to the character in knowing that in a typical thing, usually it's the, the, the male, the man who's like, oh, well, yeah, we can leave our kids behind, but this is, you, this is you know what I mean? I mean, it's, I'm a dad, I, I, don't, I would never do that, but at the same time, you know, for a mother to basically be like, we're bringing Paige into the spy business and she could get killed and then we're leaving Henry. I mean, it's such, a, if it, it would play totally different if it was Philip making those decisions. Where were you, was that important for you that your role did that? Sorry, I'm really struggling with this. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know if it was important, but it was really interesting. You know, it was an endlessly interesting to get to be a, to, to be the character that got to do it, you know. Um, uh, yeah, I, I just think we haven't seen as much of that, so I think that was interesting to have Philip be the more emotional and relatable one. And um, yeah, I, I think absolutely. I think that's what's that was what was more fresh about the story. And uh, so much to unpack uh, for the when we're going to get to the garage scene, which is <laughs> like just rewind, rewind, and play it constantly. Um, but weirdly, the first thing I thought at the end of this episode was, you know, what is Stan saying to Henry? In the scene where there's no... <laughs> Yeah, actually, you need to um, work on your slap shot. One of the things, one of the things that uh, he did say, like in real life, was you're not going to be allowed to eat any more food until you go home, and that was kind of devastating. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> in, all, <laughs> in all seriousness, um, what what was said was actually what was happening when we were when we were filming the scene. He actually told me, you know, exactly how. Stan would break the news like, hey, by the way. <laughs> by the way. So, it, was, uh, it, it was fun. It was interesting. And it was really, it, it definitely, in the moment, was heartbreaking, too, because it was like, wow, they didn't tell me this entire time. And now, again, they leave you with the baggage. Like, are you serious? Well, it's, it, it's, it's a silent scene. Uh, there was so much. Yeah. Uh, you yeah, know, so went into it. <laughs> so what you saw was the silent part, but before that we were we were talking for about five minutes, I'd say. Like each time we we took a we took a, uh, a take. And each time he, he said something different, but the the main thing was your parents really did love you. They just they couldn't stay and they couldn't bring you with them. Yeah. As I, th I think as Right, everybody starts to cry now. <laughs> as as viewers, and and, and uh, they'll tell you uh, that's it's such an amazing scene because you can't hear what happened, and you've yeah. put Stan in this terrible, terrible situation, <laughs> right? Where he's like, "Let me tell you the truth about your parents being, you know, Russian spies." And oh, by the way, I'm now adopting you, basically. <laughs> that's bad news. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a great cook. Uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of, I guess it's been answered, I don't know, but I feel like what was said was what you saw. Uh, it's, I'm always hesitant to sort of write outside what the writers wrote, so it was written as, as you saw it, and I feel like that's really beautiful writing. Sometimes it's more important to see what's happening than to hear what's happening, and that was one of those moments that felt appropriate. Uh, so that's that's what we said. Uh, well, that brings up a good point for for the actors too. It's it's you're allowed your own. I mean, you're, they're telling you things, and and there's the subtext is sometimes maybe explained to them. Maybe it's maybe it's not. Maybe Chris doesn't explain it as well during the directing, but open to interpretation. Um, tell us about the, the the scene in the garage, which is again I keep saying this word iconic. Stan has basically, <laughs> it's like it all everybody had to we had to see that scene. And then it plays out in ways that can be interpreted many ways. So how did you interpret that scene? Was were the Jennings playing Stan, or did or, or does Stan believe them? He's you know, there's, it's very tense. Yeah, I mean, again, I would sort of not to be coy, but I feel like what you saw is how I interpreted it. Uh, 
and you know, I'm always hesitant to hear actors talk about the meaning of a. I am no more qualified to speak about what Stan was doing than any of you who've been with our show for all this time and know these characters. Just because I happen to play him, I don't think Noah Emmerich is any more authoritative, although it would be misinterpreted as such, I think, if I said something declarative in that way. So I feel like hopefully what I felt is communicated through the work, and I feel like that's the best way I can communicate what I felt. Uh, and I leave the words to these guys. Did you feel that, like that? Did you feel that Stan was having a, a moral quandary at that very moment? Uh, that seems probable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> There's also like a slight level. I, I, I maybe I've also been so trained by these guys for six years to not talk about anything that I feel like I'm gonna I'm gonna get zapped if I say anything. <laughs> That's too outside the box. Yes, like you've, you've spent six seasons of them saying, don't give away any spoilers. Well, yeah. It's over. You can well, actually Stan, do whatever you I'll want. I'll tell you what Stan really. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a moment in that garage scene um, where, weirdly, and I, I would you talk to you guys about the writing, when Stan comes down, it's, it's super tense. And, but then Stan randomly just says, hi, Paige. <laughs> tell me about that choice. I loved it too. Because he's the truth. He's like, no, I want to talk to you. You're yeah. Tell me yeah. Maybe. I, it's funny. We, you know, uh, we spent a lot of time on that final script. Right. More time on that final script than any other script on the Americans. We spent more time editing the final scene than any scene. But we spent more time writing any scene. Uh, on, on that scene in the garage. We, we wrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it. And I don't think we knew that we had it until the day, well, maybe the day before the read through, I think we felt good. And it really was the read through that made us realize we were gonna be okay. Because when we got to a place where we thought the shape and, and of the scene was right, and then we heard these actors take it around the track at what for them was 80% and it worked great and none of them spun out. Uh, it was an indication that it would hold together. But that moment, that high page, it came from us. We kept rewriting the opening of the scene because the question of how, how would Stan greet them? And I think what we were looking for was something that, you know, on the one hand, he's a professional FBI agent, and he has a lot of experience interrogating people. But in this case, he brings all of that experience, but he's also off his game, and he has to, and he's in control He's being controlled by his intuitions too, and his and this relationship is really what's going to inform the scene. The relationship that we've seen over these past six seasons is what's going to drive the scene much more than his experience as an FBI agent. Right. The experience as an FBI agent is the thing that's going to keep him from getting shot or hurt in the scene. Right. That became clear to us pretty early on, right. but beyond that, it was the relationship that was going to inform how everything played out. And in the writer's room, when you're making those uh, decisions on, on how to spill that out, I want to talk to uh, Matthew. So, Matthew, do you believe that, uh, that Philip is trying to spin Stan, or is he really being honest in, when he talks to him? I, I think for the most part, he was being honest with him. And, the, and obviously, in Philip's mind, his, his kind of mandate in that moment is to get them out of the garage. So there are moments, I think, there's an infusion of that's lending itself to trying to get them out. But for the most part, I played it as, as honest and sincere. And, uh, and then when you said to him, I wish you had stayed with S, so that seems kind of a burn almost. <laughs> no, no, no. I think, it, again, he's sincere in that moment because I think he, he's trying to, I think he's trying to appeal to his, he's trying to break down the FBI wall in that moment and and kind of appeal to his, human nature and you know if it comes across as a burn i'm i'm sorry <laughs> well there <laughs> I wish i knew how to quit you and that <laughs> and that's quick and that's quickly in that scene followed up by uh, i i think it's open to your interpretation but it's I, I, my interpretation was he was actually trying to be helpful when he said oh by the way renee might be one of us I mean, do you think that's he's trying to totally fuck up Stan's life and his nightmares? Uh, I think that's uh, pure love, mm -hmm. you know. 
it's funny. I, I heard some people comment like, yeah, "That was that was mean of him to do," or "How could he leave you with that?" Like, that's the greatest gift he could. He, I mean, if if you think about it logically, that's treason for Philip to do. He he's 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 potentially unveiling an agent, maybe costing her her life, for Sand's sake. So I interpret that as a great act of love, and respect. And I'm going to keep it that way. Yeah. I don't care. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, me, uh, me too. I took that as, as very generous and very honest. Uh, at the same time, um, Harry, I thought Elizabeth was going to shoot Stan every single second. <laughs> there was probably a few thoughts about it. Yeah. There was a little coiled intensity with her. Like she, was, cause she, was, she seemed like she was clearly lying to Stan, and, and Philip seemed like he was not lying to Stan. Yeah, I didn't do much talking in that scene. I was like, where's he going with this one? <laughs> And Holly, you also had a pivotal moment there too, because when it, it when it seemed everything seemed to be sort of on the precipice of, uh, your you know your mom's going to shoot Stan. That's possible. You say you have to take care of Henry. Well, I think. Oh my God, now mine's doing it too. Okay. I think uh, for that whole last episode, my main priority is what's going to happen to Henry, and I know that Stan is really um, like his best friend in a way, and kind of like his second father, you know? So I think that I knew that Stan was the most bulletproof way that I could make sure that at least someone could try and protect him. And that was really the best effort that I could put in if I was really gonna go to Russia in that moment. So that was my priority. And again, as a reminder to that, that it's over, you don't have to protect these guys anymore. You can do your opinions. You're not giving away any spoilers. Everybody here has seen it. Um, <laughs> When Paige got off the train, how did you how did you interpret that and what what her her motivation for getting off? I interpreted it as and like we've all been saying, everyone has a different way of viewing it. But I thought that, especially in the penultimate episode, when um, Paige finds out that Elizabeth has lied to her for how many times I don't know, but that was like the last straw, you know. And it was like Paige finally felt like she was kind of being brought into the family and what they do with their life and she was feeling like a part of it and then all of a sudden something else comes along and she's not fully a part of it still and it was like how can she keep establishing a life with um out that trust I think that's really important to her and then also like I said Henry she wants to make sure that he's okay and somebody has to be here for him and, and do you I'm probably ruining some of the audience questions at the end of the day but do you believe that Paige is gonna stay in the spy game or is she out I think she's out. I mean, I don't know though. I don't know. If we do a Don't give away the ending. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you guys what happens in the movie, but um, I don't know. I don't. I don't think so. But don't tell anyone. So essentially, you went back to Claudia's apartment just for like the alcohol and hanging out. That's pretty much her life now. That's all she's got. Her and her vodka, <laughs> without the olive oil. Uh, and Kedrick. Um, it's a really interesting um, role that that you had, and this is not a reflection on you or anything. But early in the early seasons, it was like Henry was kind of like, yeah, whatever's with Henry. Like no one, you know, it's 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 like on Mad Men where they kept turning over the five different boys in the in the in the Mad Men family, and then all of a sudden in whatever season, it's a great turn of events where you guys make. You, you make Henry as the smart student, and then of course there's a lot of laughs from you guys to play that, but Henry be not only becomes the smart student, but Henry becomes uh, arguably the, I guess, the, the emotional touchstone of the finale. I was offended, and then I wasn't, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I totally agree with that, actually. I think that in the beginning, he wasn't, he didn't seem very important. Yeah, he was the younger son that was kind of annoying, you know, made stupid faces, whatever. Decided to put ice cream on his face, stuff like that. Uh, but the longer the show ran, the more, he, like, the more depth he got and the more that came out about him, like, the fact that he was having... Uh, he, he had the hots for <laughs> oh what finish that sentence boy 
uh, all right. And then that he was smart. And then <laughs> that he wanted to go away. And then that he wasn't allowed to go away. And then that he went away anyway. And then at the end, that he was the last one left until Paige came back. You're welcome. <laughs> no. <laughs> I saved you. Wait. How dare you? Where? I got off that train for you. Hey, last time I remember, I saved you from Creepy Guy. I oh, my God. <laughs> he always holds that against me. Uh-huh. Even if I peed my pants, okay? Oh my God, I think we found our spinoff. <laughs> I saved you. I saved you from There you go. Uh, maybe, and maybe Joe and Joel, can you, can you speak to this? I mean, um, as you know, and, and like no offense to say, like young, ch they're not ch children, they're not child actors anymore, but th there's a certain amount of luck that goes into sort of casting, you know, six seasons before uh, with younger actors and you, you don't really know what's going to happen. And everybody was saying, oh, Holly Teller, what, what, she's developed into this magnificent actress and then Kedrick you 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 came al I mean just for because you got more material you really came alive in this last episode of this last season where you I mean I think fans will probably agree with this you had to play moments where you're on the phone not knowing what the audience is knowing that hey you don't know about your parents and that they're going to leave you etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, you really came through on that can you can you guys Thank speak you. to how good these two are well they're uh, yeah I mean that I think it's evident to everyone how, how amazing they were. And, you know, when we, when we cast them, you're right, they were very young when we cast them at the beginning. And there is a certain amount of holding your breath and hoping it's going to work out. But I think we also saw very early on that it was going to work out. And, and we, couldn't have, we couldn't have told this story if it hadn't. If they hadn't both been enormously talented, this whole story would not have worked. So thank God for that. But I, I think the other thing to, to point out about uh, Henry in particular is I don't know that we shared there was a sort of maybe a consensus that, well, Henry's disappeared. What's going on with Henry? This is the thing you see all the time in, in television where sort of the younger brother uh, kind of disappears. And I don't think that was exactly our outlook uh, about the whole thing. We understood it because he, he wasn't sort of activated all the time on the screen in a lot of stories. But we always felt that the character was incredibly important, that he was in that family, even though he sort of disappeared in the family because of how busy the parents were and the fact that he was younger so he wasn't playing the role that Paige was playing, he was the most American member of that family, right? He was the true American kid uh, in a show that is fundamentally about those issues. And he had not inherited the par either of the parents' Russian souls in the way that, that Paige had in, in many ways. And so although I don't, I don't think we understood until the final season exactly the way that that was gonna come back around, his thematic centrality and emotional importance to everything, everything in that family was clear to us. So it wasn't a surprise to us that he ended up being sort of a, a fulcrum of everything in the end. And, and again, we knew that when the, when the, when the bell tolled that Kedrick would be there. And, and Brandon, I, I haven't forgot you down there in the end. Um. Tell us what it's like to play the most frustrated FBI agent <laughs> in history of television. Frustrating. <laughs> no, it's, um, it's, it's so well-crafted. And it's, um, it was a real opportunity to see how, how slowly and how swiftly the wheels of justice turn. Um, this, this show, which I take my hat off to, to the writers, stay consistent in that it was a high-speed car chase that had to obey the speed limit <laughs> the entire time. So things could only happen as fast as they could happen. And sometimes that meant slowing things down and speeding them up. And so um, processing the information through the FBI standpoint was, um, I, th I think, one, one thing that we saw in Adderholt that the writers developed over the years was someone who, who had the temperament to be patient with how quickly or how slowly that information came in and but could make quick decisions and necessary decisions to um to be effective and i think he was pretty effective i, I like to think of him as the uh, most competent member <laughs> we needed we needed a uh, kind of a, you know more grounding for the show and that's what adderhold was for me 
but he but he literally gets n zero satisfaction. Uh, I mean, he gets married and he has a kid, so he has. A, <laughs> I think he's getting satisfied, uh, you know, other places. He gets a he promotion. You know, you know, Dennis caught no one, right? <laughs> That Dennis caught no one at the end, right? No, um, but you know we have. Um, in, in, in in essence, we we did right. We busted up yeah. a, uh, a a whole network, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they, we we have at least three less illegals than we had, and if it weren't for Dennis, then they they could still be you know wreaking havoc. Yeah. Noah, when did you realize that that your character, um, which is ob he's obviously very smart, he has the unenviable task of these spies moving in next to them, um, that he has what is, I think, sort of this, there's something lacking in his, uh, he's, he needs to be loved in some way. He needs to have an emotional core. And, uh, you know, he loses his wife. He's going to S. Phillips, his best friend, even though he's a spy. Um, and now maybe Renee is uh, a spy as well, and she's loved him, and there's going to be all this doubt about whether, and there's, again, the scene at the end with, um, uh, with or without you, you're looking at her sleeping. And is is he ever gonna know if Renee is a spy or not? Tune in next week. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's hard for me to imagine Stan letting that lie. Uh, I think he's pretty shattered at the end of this moment of his life. Like this story here, he's I don't know what he's equipped. Are constitutionally able to do, but it's hard to imagine him letting that be. Uh, and I, I, I need the writers for anything more. <laughs> well, and, and so Joe and Joel, okay, you add to that a little bit. I mean, there, we talk about intentionally leaving things um, open to uh, interpretation. Is Renee a spy? So Renee is the spinoff, then it's just like... Well, here's the thing, is that everybody in this room was as qualified to answer that as anybody else, because this is the end. Yeah. And the rest is writ in our imagination, which is one of the beautiful gifts, I think, of, of, of watching television, of telling stories, is that the writer is no more qualified, as I mentioned, the actor is no more qualified. Now, no one up here is more qualified than any of you to talk about what happens next. I say never trust a woman who goes to bed fully made up with her hair blown out. <laughs> Now you tell me. <laughs> Told you in the garage. You, you should ask them with a show of hands if she's a spy or not. Just ask them. <laughs> and uh, Carrie uh, and, and Matthew, I'll give you, before we turn over to the audience, the, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a spy series, but really it's a series about mar a marriage. So um, six seasons of playing that and being able to, to go from being totally disparate um, young Russians who don't know each other and thrown together and then all of these things. How was that working, working it out? And obviously, you two um, um, had a meet cute on the set, and look at you now. <laughs> the, it is really my m most favorite uh, relationship story, and I think it what Joe and Joel were able to create in the context of a spy world to help elevate and push and pull all of the emotions and the jealousies and the, you know, you're not just worried your husband thinks someone at work is cute. He's literally fucking them and he's marrying them, you know? And, um, and you're doing other things and, you know, it's, it's like a fantasy world for every fear and hope, hopes being sexy disguises, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's for marriage, and it was such an interesting metaphor for it. So I found that really satisfying uh, as a world to um, like read uh, as a story, and it's so fun to, to be a part of. Um, and uh, I don't know, what do you have to say? I agree, it was, you know, it was like a, it was, uh relationship under, um, under a microscope, you know, it was magnified, as Kelly said, everything was times a hundred. So to, to, to play that was incredible. But the kind of, uh, the, the w where we arrived in episode one, season one, the, what had been set up was so, so 
incredibly interesting. That you go, oh my God, they've been put together, they've been made to do this. You know, he wants to, you know, you kind of presented a number of almost ticking bombs and went, right, now work through a relationship. And it was, it was incredible to play because it was never one, one thing. You, you were always, it was so rich. It was, a, it was a real steak dinner every night. All right, let's, uh, there's microphones, but they were passed around, so uh, let's open it up to the audience. <laughs> easy. I didn't think I would. Okay. Um, so with all of the roles that Philip and Elizabeth had to play, I'd really love to hear more about the hair and makeup experience and process. And Joe and Joel specifically, I'm wondering if any of those um, roles physically resembled or historically are accurate to anybody that you know in real life. <laughs> <laughs> the disguises. Yes. Yeah, we'll pass on the second part of the question. There's just <laughs> nothing good that can come out of answering that. Um, Many of them looked like my mother. I admit <laughs> there was one carry head that really looked like John Denver. <laughs> remember. remember that? Remember John Denver? Um, but we had, a, you know, these guys can tell you about the, their side of the process, which was uh, extensive on a disguise side. For us, the process we arrived at with Chris Long really was Every, we, we would write into the script a little bit about who the character was, but a very little bit. We'd say, Elizabeth in disguise as Stephanie, a home care nurse, and that's all we'd write. But then some of the writers would write up a whole biography of that character, which we would then talk to the writers about, and, and then we'd send that to Chris and go back and forth. And the idea was that this is something that Elizabeth would actually do. She'd think up what is her backstory, or Philip would do, what's, what's his character's backstory. And then that would go to the hair and makeup department. And then, Chris, you can probably speak to that a bit before the actors. Yeah, it was important to us that they, that they had characters that were built on a, on a foundation that was real. So therefore, by writing bios for them, um, every department head, props, hair, makeup, everybody, art department, when they were you know, dressing their spies, you know, when they're playing characters' houses, that there was, a, there was a background and a reality to them because it's, it's all about honesty and reality. So it couldn't just be, okay, they're going to be in disguise and just somebody makes a wig up and somebody puts wardrobe on. They had to play a character that, which then allowed them, especially say, let's take Stephanie, for instance. Stephanie took on a whole persona and character of its own with the way that you played her because of, you know, that wig and that glasses. And the thing I used to love was that when these guys would um, do the hair and makeup tests, so we'd look at extensive hair and makeup tests for each character, and we'd have like four or five different wigs and four or five different sets of wardrobe and glasses and things like that. But Kerry and Matthew would always stand in character like in, in those makeup photographs, which is like really absolutely key because you, know, you can't be just trying on wigs and hair and makeup and just putting a funny face on or something. Right. It, has to, it has to, you have to stand in character, and that's how we got to inhabit and live with those characters. So when Joel and Joe and I were looking at them, you know, we'd actually see in their eyes the characters they were going to play that they were defining at the time. And very often, unbeknown to Kerry, Stephanie would come home. <laughs> the mousy Stephanie. Time to put Stephanie back in the box, darling. <laughs> we, we love Stephanie. We loved everything about her. I mean... Even just in picking her car and things like that, and the, and the the, uh, the crucifix and stuff that's hanging from her rearview mirror and stuff like that. it's all part of character. It's all part of that thing that we created, or is created around that character. The, the, that we would hope, or they did as spies, they would because they couldn't in any way be betrayed by by something. So they had to live and breathe it. I'll add uh, one thing, which is we did a, a panel recently with some people from the CIA who said that uh, they thought that some of the disguises were really a little too perfect, that in reality, they tend to be a little more haphazard. But on the other hand, we got a book of uh, pictures of disguises the Stasi used, the East German intelligence service throughout their history, uh, color photographs of that they had kept in their archives. And it was absolutely shocking how much these looked like our disguises. I mean you could have picked a few of them out as looking exactly like, we didn't model them on them, but that's just what they looked like. So 
we think they were pretty accurate in a lot of ways. We did start to recycle them in the end, and we did that because we just felt that they wouldn't have this endless wardrobe of like wigs. It's just like this infinite choice of like 40 wigs. So we did start to, if you, if you look, certain wigs and certain outfits and certain things were, and in fact, I think Matthew saw, wore some of Kerry's wigs sometimes. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, were vice versa, yeah. Yeah. we felt they have a set of like 10 wigs and we try and figure it out from there. Go ahead. Um, you know, for so long, as you mentioned, Elizabeth stays in that character and, and very devoted to Russia. But there are a few times throughout the seasons that you see her kind of come out as a person. And one of those times is when, you know, she befriends the Asian woman, but then has to kill her husband. Um, and then at the, in the last season, when she is um, also befriends the sick woman, you see her kind of taking on drawing, and you see her kind of doing some of the drawing on her own. Is that intentional to kind of give the audience a glimpse into kind of who she is on, you know, not in terms of being so dedicated and kind of as a quote-unquote real person, I guess? Yeah. <laughs> well... <laughs> um, well to us, she's always a real person. Right. And the dedication doesn't have to go away when it's pierced by other aspects of her humanity. But, those, but one of the things we liked about both of those relationships, the Young hee relationship and, and the one with Erica Haskert this season, was that they got to shake the core of Elizabeth and challenge that determination. We don't think she ever let go of it, really. But maybe that's part of what made it so interesting to, to see it get rattled a little, uh, to see little fine cracks appear in that exterior of hers. Thank you. You want to steal him? He's been waiting longer than me. Oh, sorry, I didn't know there was a mic on the side. <laughs> and I'm not the one who chooses, but go ahead, yes. Um, one of the many things the show gets right is um, capturing the zeitgeist of um, yeah, the 80s America. And uh, I was wondering, after playing the Americans for so many seasons, what did it teach you about uh, being or America? What did it teach you about America? Parents uh, paid attention to their kids a lot less. <laughs> the right amount. Right, it was, that was better, wasn't it? I mean, we're both we're both children of, of the '80s, and and it did it, it caused us to harken back a lot. As Carrie points out, to what was actually better back then, which was a lot of things like not being glued to your cell phone, you know, 24 hours a day, and and just the way that all of our brains seemed to function better without the, all the technology and the you know the the lack of complete. The, obsession with what your kids are doing 24 hours every single day a lot of things we look back on as better I, you know we really focused on that there were there were a lot of bad things no bad things Kedrick. oh there were bad things <laughs> what was bad okay so bring it on come on video games Let's, were so much worse actually no i liked them better back then oh, really yeah they were See? more fun but i will tell you what was worse the fashion oh no <laughs> true Edric wearing, we're struggled, wearing with some of those. Edric struggled with some of those. with high waisted wearing. jeans. It'll be back. It'll be back. Wearing mom jeans was the worst. Why are you wearing your mother's jeans? <laughs> Pervert. And also acid wash jeans. Those were always so so much stiffer than jeans now. And that the was bad. the wool sweaters. Oh god. I would always have to beg for like a white t-shirt just so I wasn't itching yeah, they, like, 24 your skin. They do. It's like they want you to be hurting. Yeah, they, they want you. The yeah. Just, like wanted you to suffer. They're like, yeah. you're not going to be able to breathe in these and you're going to have rashes all over your body. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you're getting an insight as to how hard an actor's life really is. <laughs> you got to suffer for your art. Um, I know that music was such a huge part of the show, and something that specifically stuck out to me was the use of Peter Gabriel. Um, specifically, we do what we're told. Uh, so I would just love to hear more about how his amazing lyrics kind of fit so perfectly into the show. 
When did when did we start? Uh, was it season one that we started long, long, Gabriel, yeah. <laughs> latched onto Peter Gabriel? Uh, and did we actually correspond with him at one point? We did yeah. At one point, we exchanged letters with him, which was uh, at, at one of the sh- highlights of the show for us because we just reached out to thank him and to, to our great great surprise and glee, he responded with a really classy letter. Um, I, I think both of us grew up as huge Peter Gabriel fans, and he's just such a brilliant artist, poet, and being able to, you know, you collaborate with these great musicians, but you, but you never connect with them. And it was just incredible to have that continuity over the course of these seasons. And that sequence with You Do What You're Told was a very tricky one for us because we had Elizabeth doing a scene. There was, there was a lot of dialogue with the Russian there. And we found... I, I think, Chris, you found this in your director's cut, that just allowing the, the music to overwhelm the scene worked, and we were lucky because there were subtitles. So we could just sort of ta- allow it to take over. You want to talk? Yeah, it was, a, it was an incredibly important scene because the information was, was very important. But we actually had two very long Russian scenes back to back, and we were very aware of that. And there was no way to, to split them up any further in the story. And so... Um, we found, we found this way, it was what was really interesting about the scene, because Kerry had a few lines in Russian, was just Kerry listening, actually, because that was where you were invested, you were absolutely invested in, in the way this was, was hitting Elizabeth. And then, uh, actually, it was our editor, Amanda Pollock, who first put that, uh, put that track in, and suddenly we just realized that the, that the we do what we're told was fitting so well, and we just doubled it uh, and looped it several, several times. So it sort of went from this background piece of score to sort of co- commenting on the narrative, which we don't normally do, but it really works in this case. And then we, then we eventually actually added a scene where we had her look at the hill in the, in the aircraft toilet, do you remember? Which wasn't in our first cut. But mainly, I think, because we sort of loved the way it was playing out. It was a real good punctuation point to it. But it was, uh, it's interesting, look. Just going back to without, with, with or Without You for one second, we spent a long, much longer editing the music than the picture. Right, guys? I mean, we, the picture didn't change that much from the first editor's cut, to be honest. Um, but we spent a long time, or once we, we tried several, several tracks, as the guy said, then we started sliding the picture around to fit the music. But it's sort of a chicken and egg situation with these things. Um, but credit has to be given for sure to our editors who, who really were terrific at, at and understanding where we wanted to go with it. We're getting the wrap-up sign here, so I know that everybody has lots of questions. And uh, again, this is things will be open to interpretation. People will be talking about the Americans for a very long time. Can we uh, can we do rapid fire with these three people who yeah, stood patiently? Yes, we'll okay, do rapid yes. rapid fire. Matthew says we can do it. We can do it. I don't have to. Just rapid fire. Rapid fire. Here we go. Rapid fire. Start right here. You've been waiting. How long did it take you to uh, get the Welsh accent perfected? I think it's brilliant. It's still work. It's still work. <laughs> I'm from Dublin. I'm Irish. I can oh. appreciate it. Um, first of all, thank you. Fantastic show. Iconic. One of the best ever. So really, thank you. Thank you. Um, the acting was brilliant. It wouldn't have been what it was without the acting. But my question is about the writing. And it, it was a lot of writing in some of these shows is lazy. And for an audience, especially TV fans, you know, we know a lot now. We read a lot and we, you know, we can pick out the holes in the, in the, in the plots and the stories and whatnot. But um, when, when Elizabeth was doing a runner and trying to take off, she was covering her tracks and closing up the, you know, the, uh, the, the fuse box and whatnot. Where did you guys get the, uh, you know, the research from to get so precise and so specific about some of that stuff? I thought it was amazing that you, you didn't leave loose ends, you didn't leave gaps. And that made it all the more believable. Well, I referenced before how obsessive we are. And the last thing we ever wanted was anybody saying, this doesn't add up, this doesn't make sense. Because I think our biggest fear is, is whenever you have that, it punctures the world of the story and you drop out of it. So we would, we would really go to, to any ends, whatever we had to do to, to find out anything and, and to close any loop. And we were even okay sometimes. It, it's, it's, it's sort of funny because it was okay with us sometimes if it's hard to track the story. Right. That's okay. As long as the story makes sense, if it's convoluted, if it's hard to follow, as long as it feels real, you're still in the story. But as soon as you feel like the story doesn't follow, yeah. as soon as you find a hole in it, as soon as you said it seems like somebody's been lazy and connecting dots, then you fall out of the, wor- out of the world. And that's what we just never wanted to happen. 
and in terms of the details, I'd say our obsession, as Joe says, was with authenticity. And so in the script, in the research project process, but also in talking to the director and all the department heads, all those decisions, all those little things about closing the fuse box and making sure that she was doing it in the right way, by the time we got several seasons in, everybody knew how obsessed with authenticity we were. So the, these were all questions that were asked during the prep process and dealt with on the set. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks. And quickly, on these, over here. In the garage, when the confrontation happens and Stan's like, you made my life a joke, and Philip says, it was my life that was the joke, I just thought to myself, that is so devastating to Elizabeth. But it doesn't really seem like she registers that. And I just, <laughs> every time we talk about the, I've heard people talk about the show, it, it said it's really about a marriage. And that to me was sort of, I was intrigued as to what you thought of that as how it was played, if that was, because I think that Philip was, I interpreted him as being authentic. So that how you, if she interpreted that in the way that she would, which was um, he's trying to pull one over, or if, how that affected her, I guess. I'm curious. That's interesting, I'd be curious how you would answer that. I, I, know, what you, I know what you mean. Um, but I actually do think that Philip was being completely honest in that moment. But I think, um, and I think you can understand when I say their marriage is a little less sensitive than others <laughs> in <laughs> some ways. So I don't think she's going to go home and cry about that one. But, um, <laughs> but in a way, I think... To speak more to that, I think what they have, I think I would argue no one else has. Do you know what I mean? They know each other in a way that no one else in the whole world will ever know each one of them because they're the only ones doing this crazy, weird life. So I think that glue supersedes him saying my life was a joke. I think she understands what he's saying because she feels that. That's why she said, get out of it. Your life, his life it was a joke to him. I'm, I'm sorry you misheard. I actually said, my wife is a joke. <laughs> In a Welsh accent. Thank you. Th that's a woman whose final words to her son were, um, what your dad said. So, not, a, not a big heart there. Okay, last question. The Russian characters were great. If you could talk anything about that. For, for, I'll, I'll quickly say that from the beginning, it felt important that this show was an American story and a Russian story. And even though obviously most of the audience was going to be an American audience, we hoped that people were going to watch it in Russia too, and it was going to have a, a Russian audience as well. And to just, in a way, try to not just have Russian characters, but have them be have their own world, an important part of this fabric, not just a side story, but just a fundamental part of what the show was and writing those characters, developing them, making sure they, was, they were authentic, making sure the language was translated properly, making sure people watching this show in Russia would feel that those characters were accurately represented, which of course hopefully would feel that way to an American audience too. So everybody, everybody involved with the show put the same care and thought into everything with those characters as with the American characters. Pajalsta. So just to, just to wrap it up, uh, just the, the difficulty, and I'm sure you, you're amazing ATX TV fans, you know this, the, the enormity of pulling off six seasons of brilliance is exceptionally hard to do. The acting on this show is fantastic top to bottom. So is the writing, so is the directing. Uh, here's to hoping that all the Emmys come your way and congratulations on a major achievement. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all.